This is Chris Mitchell with the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. We're at the Austin Broadband Community Summit in the year 2016. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, Jason, can you tell us a little bit about who you are and who you're with? Sure. Uh, my name is Jason Hardebeck, and I'm the broadband coordinator for the city of Baltimore. And tell us a little bit about your background before you came into that position. Sure. Well, I'm uh, actually an entrepreneur and software uh, technologist by training. About two years ago or so, I was asked to co-chair a Smarter City Task Force by the mayor, uh, which I did, and I guess uh, demonstrating my um, uh, willingness to volunteer. Uh, one of the recommendations that came out of the task force was to establish a broadband coordinator position to really look at uh, developing a strategy for the city. And uh, so I was tapped to, to lead that effort, and I've been in that role for about seven months now. A lot of times in, uh, when I work with people in rural areas, they'll often look to larger cities and think everything's much better there. What is happening in Baltimore that requires some kind of intervention? That's a great question, and you're right. It, um, it has a lot of that feel of ru the rural community. Um, one of the challenges is the fact that we actually have, you know, Baltimore being a rather old city, aging infrastructure, uh, we have a single, really a single provider, a uh, cable company. Um, Verizon has chosen not to uh, expand the Fios network into the city. It's all, on all the surrounding communities. So we really have very little in the way of competition, a few you know, small local providers. Um, and we've got an opportunity to actually create a, an environment that will support more competition. So that's really what my focus has been on. I think a lot of people associate Baltimore with being you know, a, a city that's struggling financially. Um, what kind of strategies is Baltimore pursuing uh, for something that's perceived as being a very expensive kind of project? That's a great, that's a great point. Um, I would say Baltimore actually is not struggling per se. We have a very vibrant community. Um, we have a lot of uh, very strong anchor institutions, whether it's you know, the healthcare and medical sector, cybersecurity and the like, but what we don't have is or what we've never really looked at is is our um, our broadband uh, as a as an infrastructure play, and so um, I think one of the opportunities is to take a look at the assets that we do have, and figure out if we can work all work together to develop a more um, you know take a more strategic view of of, uh, of the opportunity. And I think, uh, like many cities, Baltimore does have some conduits, some fiber assets. Uh, what do you have there in that regard, and how are you trying to use it? That's a great, uh, great point. So one of the things Baltimore has that's it's somewhat unique is that we own our own conduit system, right? So there's, there's a tremendous uh, amount of conduit in the ground. Not all of it is usable, um, and a lot of it uh, needs to be upgraded or, or expanded, uh, but it is there. Um, we also have um, a uh, quite a bit of dark fiber. We just re uh, recently completed an overbuild project where we have, have added uh, additional fiber on top of an existing network that serves the first responder network. And we did that with the express purpose of being able to use it uh, for uses outside of government. So essentially we have a 50 mile rank that uh, encircles the city of Baltimore and we're looking in addition to that we have uh, some fiber, uh, some BTOP that was you know, funded through the BTOP grant a few years ago um, and it's ready to be activated. I, I wonder if two years ago you heard someone saying some of the conduits not usable you would have had the same reaction I think some people in our audience may have which is to right. say what does that mean it's not usable? Well a lot of it is rather old um, so it may be crushed or, or um, uh, you know damaged in some way so it hasn't all been proofed. Um, and a lot of it is really at capacity. If you, you know, open up a manhole cover, there's not to say that we always know exactly what's in there. And that's true for a lot of large cities, especially with a very aging, you know, um, physical plant. Absolutely. A lot of this was done in times before they really mapped it well, I think. Absolutely. Now, one of the things I think about Baltimore is an announcement from your mayor. I want to say maybe it was two years ago now. I remember I was at an event. Mm -hmm. I don't remember which event. Mm -hmm. But she gave an interview in which she said, economic development is not possible without fiber. Uh, what's happening in terms of the leadership of the city? No, that's correct. And Mayor Rawlings Blake did actually say that and is a, a huge proponent of that, that, you know, I'm proof of that. Um, 
We are actually uh, in the middle of a primary race for mayor, and, and um, the current mayor has decided not to uh, run for re-election. Every one of the the main uh, mayoral candidates have expressed a strong support, some in more eloquently than others, uh, but uh, strong support for the importance of broadband in the future of the city, both economically as well as from a digital inclusion standpoint. So I think from that standpoint, you know, Baltimore um, is, is, is going to be well served by whoever is in office. I also think some of the leadership is coming from what some people call civil society. Um, you, have, you noticed that you have great you mentioned that you have great community anchors, the, the medical school and whatnot. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about some of that leadership that's happening outside of the local government that's pushing for a better solution? Sure. So Baltimore is a very vibrant startup community. Uh, you know, technologists are obviously uh, very interested in um, in large amounts of bandwidth. And our industries really uh, depend on it, and and not just today's, but um, but tomorrow. And the future of Baltimore's economy are really going to be focused on a number of, of industries that are are going to require um, huge amounts of bandwidth. Again, with healthcare, um, and bioinformatics, and and um, all of our um, all the big data uh, companies that are starting in Baltimore and our proximity to DC and other large um, you know government agencies and customers. It's it's uh, it's a it's essential, right? And that's that's just on the on the business side. On the resident side, we have, uh, you know, Baltimore is is in the top. And I should know this right off the bat, but we're in the top three or four destinations for millennials, right? So we have a lot of young people moving in. They're either coming in for college and staying, or they're being attracted to Baltimore. We have a tremendous cost of living uh, advantage over larger cities. And we have all the amenities, and broadband is a given. You know, we need to do a better job there. It's actually interesting you say that. I grew up in uh, Pennsylvania, and some of our family friends that had younger children um, in eastern Pennsylvania, they love heading down to Baltimore for the weekend right. and that sort of thing. We have better sports teams down there. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, uh, I think the, uh, one other source of, of local interest that has brought um, my attention to somewhat is um, in part because people love Baltimore so much. I think there's a fair amount of philanthropy that's also been involved. And can you tell us a little bit about what role that's played in terms of moving the, f the community forward and making uh, Internet access a bigger priority? Yeah, absolutely. And, and we have a number of very strong foundations uh, that are not only local in nature but also national, right? So, but every one of them has a footprint in Baltimore and um, spends a, you know, at least portion of their effort um, and resources in the community. And, and Baltimore has, you know, is a, has a, a lot of challenges. You know, economically we have a, a significant number of our um, residents are below the poverty line. Um, so, you know, when we look at some of these solutions to bring, you know, gig internet, for example, uh, to um, cities or towns where a significant number of the of the residents are consumers and you know the take rate is um, you know 30 40 50 percent we don't have that same luxury in, in looking at the city as a whole so foundations and other philanthropic uh, efforts not just from the nonprofit side but also the for-profit side um, we're gonna look at that as one way of building out that network and actually providing um, you know connectivity across the board not just to the rich people Excellent. And one last question is dealing with the schools. A lot of mm -hmm. communities, particularly those without municipal utilities, although also including those, mm -hmm. they start with the schools. What role do the schools play in your strategy moving forward? Right. So that's a great question. Um, schools, you know, Baltimore City Schools number about 185 or so. Uh, what we're actually looking at right now and, and uh, working with schools, is, and they are, they are on their own network, right? They have a... Um, they have a completely separate network from the city, um, and city schools does not report directly to Baltimore City government, so they're um, uh, they are independent. But uh, we are in in discussions with using that that fiber ring that I mentioned and bringing fiber to every school, um, and looking at E-rate as a potential funding source to help subsidize that construction, um, and then at the same time overbuilding um, and extending a potential. In a municipal network into you know and to the location of every school uh, and building that middle mile network out
And what is the impact on the school telecommunications budget? I'm, I'm always curious about that question. We're still figuring that out. I mean, right now, we're, they have a pretty significant you know, operating subsidy for, for E-Rate. And with the recent changes you know, in the last year or two, the opportunity to use um, E-Rate dollars to subsidize construction is very interesting to us. Thank you so much for joining us and telling us a little bit more about what's happening in Baltimore. My pleasure.